I'm back. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed your uh, holidays. I hope everybody had a great time with as much family as you could uh, safely be with. Happy to be back with you. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, thank you for bringing this event back together again. And thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. We are asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Since um, it's been a while, and I will make the assumption that most people are like me, slow to remember and slow to retain. So that said, I'll do a recap to remind us of how we got where we are, or just to remind us where we are. Uh, first of all, we're studying the Articles of Faith, which are simply uh, what we believe, what we believe as Baptists. And there are 24 Articles of Faith, and we are on article number 11, which is the perseverance of saints. Our main scripture has been John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so we have slowly dissected that verse. And when I say slowly, I mean the extreme of the word. Around Mount Sinai, we are all amazed at how long the Holy Spirit can keep me on a verse, which is a testament to God's word. We can spend a lifetime of studying and and at the end of the lifetime, we will only have scratched the surface. I give kudos to our pastor for allowing me the freedom to not rush. And so that said, verse 32, uh, and the truth will set you free, is where we are. We're on the last part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. On July 4th, 1776, the Continental Congress approved of independence. That document was penned by Thomas Jefferson, and it states four major freedoms for all U.S. citizens. And I'll state them briefly. Uh, it, it says that we are equal and we should be treated equal. It says that we have the right to life, the right to freedom, and the right to pursue happiness, or the right to pursue our own dreams. And just as being a citizen of the United States gives certain freedoms that we enjoy, Romans the 8th chapter could be called the Christian's Declaration of Freedom. Those freedoms that we enjoy because we are part of the kingdom of God. Those truths that are mine right now, not just when I die. I can enjoy those freedoms right now. In Romans, the 8th chapter, uh, Paul declares four spiritual freedoms that we enjoy because of our union with Jesus Christ. Verses 1 through 4, which we've covered, is freedom from judgment and no condemnation. Verses 5 through 17, which we have also covered, is freedom from defeat. And then finally, verses 18 through 30 is freedom from discouragement, and so which is our third freedom, and we are currently studying verses 28 through 30 and mainly verse 28 and it reads and we know that in all things god works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose and we said that the promises of god uh working all things for good 
is not for everybody. It can be, but the conflict or the tension is that not everybody loves God. And we said that God will overrule and work through even the toughest tragedies and circumstances that we may encounter in this sinful world that we live in. There is no situation that God cannot work through, no human God cannot touch, no chain of authority he cannot reach. There are no doors he cannot open and there are none that he cannot close. The things that God will, can and will do are endless for those who love him. But the thing that he will not do is force himself on us. He, he will not go against our free will. Now that is not to say that he will not allow things in our lives to get our intention. Things that will drive us to himself. As in Paul on the Damascus Road. Even so, with all the nudging, there are still people that no matter what things come their way, no matter what nudging from God, they still refuse to come to the Lord. And that is their right. But that does not mean that God is not concerned about the people that do not love him. The amazing thing is that God has chosen to love us. He has chosen to love the whole world. He is always waiting with open arms to receive us. If you recall, we paused our study right here uh, because we wanted to take a, a look at uh, how much the Father loves us. And, and so uh, I'm calling the pause the scenic route. Uh, and, and so we, we just in, as in, you know, if you're driving down the road and you decide, hey, I want to go this way to look at the scene, uh, we're taking the scenic route to take an amazing view of just how much the Father loves us and the as extent to which he is going to show us that love. And so to do that, we began a panoramic view of an encounter between a Pharisee named Nicodemus and Jesus. It's a familiar scene uh, to most of us, and, and it's found in John, the third chapter. And so for clarity purposes, we started with verse 1 and painstakingly made our way down to verse 10. Uh, when a nagging question presented itself and caused me to pause and take a closer look. And, and, and the question was, why a Pharisee? Why would God, why would Jesus choose a Pharisee to give the whole plan of salvation in a nutshell? In a nutshell why would God choose the most arrogant, self-centered, and hypocritical uh, of that era to receive a statement of fact that would impact the whole world. Why not choose one of his followers, Peter, or James, or John, to write about it? Since it's only recorded, it's only recorded in the Gospel of John. Why would Jesus choose a Pharisee? to receive such a profound and impactful word. It is only given to Nicodemus, a Pharisee. And, and so this is the part of the scenic route where you see something so amazing that you stop the car, get out, and just ponder. Just ponder the view in total amazement. Why Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, why would Jesus choose Nicodemus? It has to be significant because John points it out. He says there was a man 
and that man was a Pharisee, and that Pharisee's name was Nicodemus. And he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. All specific stuff. Which brings me back to the question, why a Pharisee? And not just any old Pharisee, but a man of standing. I couldn't have been, uh, it, it couldn't have been because Jesus held them in such high regard. Jesus compared them to whitewashed tombs. He said, beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, full of dead men's bones. Now, we're not given uh, a, a personal information about Nicodemus. You know, stuff like who his father was, who his mother was, who his wife, did he have any children? And, and so it caused me, since we didn't have that kind of information, it caused me to take a closer look at what was given, which was that he was a Pharisee. He was a member of the ruling counselor. The Bible, the Pharisees in the Bible were members of a religious group that more times than not, they clashed with Jesus over interpretation of the law. The Pharisees formed the they were the largest, most influential religious and political party in the New Testament time. They were consistently shown to, uh, to be opponents of Jesus, and they were also opponents of the early church. The name Pharisee means separated one. They separated themselves from society to study and teach the law. And they also separated themselves from common people because in their minds, they considered the common people to be religiously unclean. The Pharisees were extremely accurate and detail oriented in all matters pertaining to the law of Moses. They, they were more concerned about looking religious than they were about genuine faith. Uh, they taught the way to God was by obeying the law. And so we spent some time in, in the headspace of a Pharisee uh, or of the, uh, of the Pharisee sect. And, and then we continued our scenic, scenic route. And if you recall, I decided to hold off on giving my two cents answer to the question, why a Pharisee? I decided to wait until later and, and kind of uh, bring it all together, so to speak. So we symbolically got back in the car and continued on the scenic route. We picked up with verse 10 of John, the third chapter, which reads, you are a Israel, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And so in these verses, we find out that at this time in his life, Nicodemus does not believe that Jesus is from the Father. Jesus says to him, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. Then he gives Nicodemus one more illustration in verse 14. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. You can't help but marvel at the patience that Jesus is showing Nicodemus, this Pharisee. 
it's nighttime and and but we're not told how late it is but in my mind i would imagine that it's closer to being late night rather than early night simply by the fact that all the people were gone and, and i would imagine that the people hung around jesus a, as long as they could and, and time wasn't it, it, it wasn't like you would leave Jesus early in the evening. Uh, if you've ever paid attention in the Bible to a day in the life of Jesus, you would find that it was jam-packed. Jesus had time management down to a science. Time was not something that he wasted. So after what probably was a long day, he was extremely patient with Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus, being a teacher of the law, a scholar in the study of the Old Testament, should have been open to Jesus' teaching. His teaching should have made the Old Testament just come alive. It, it should have been what made it all come together. He should have had an aha moment. It's like, oh, that's what that is. Oh, you, you're it. You know, he should have had some aha moments. If the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and the chief priests had all been teaching the law and the prophets correctly, they would have been primed for Jesus' teaching, waiting for his arrival not surprised and in denial. Jesus marveled at the fact that Nicodemus was Israel's teacher and knew nothing of spiritual things. Right now, I'm marveling at the fact that this recap has taken so long. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm out of time. So join us next week. And I'll work on not being quite so long-winded. So come back next week as we continue our study. For now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Let us say amen. Goodbye.